Joanna, thank you very much for talking to us today and welcoming us to the exhibition. It sounds like it's been quite a labour of love for you. How long in the planning was this Over two years. Two years. Over two years, yeah. Okay. Yes, I've been uh, very determined that <laughs> it should happen. So where did the original idea come from? What fascinated you about Eastern Right. Right. Well, a few things. It's, it's, it's sort of, I'm a great believer in fate and I think a few things came together all at the same time. And one of them was we were already thinking about going in a French direction because we've got this fantastic story about the museum and the museum founder, Josephine Bowes, who was French, she was Parisian, very fashionable, and I was wanting to do an exhibition of uh, a, a French couturier for a while, because we've been, ever since we got a new fashion gallery, we've been building up, um, we've, we've shown Vivian Westwood shoes and Stephen Jones hats, and we were building up a, a reputation for fashion, and so I was looking, but I didn't ever think I would get this. But we had a, it was a nice, it was a nice um, way it started, was with a canaletto, which we have in this collection being lent to an exhibition in Paris and my colleague met someone there who said oh have you and she was telling her all about this new fashion gallery that went on award and you know we've had all this new exciting fashion shows and she said well um, would you you know maybe I might be able to get you an opening to the Yves Saint Laurent Foundation and so she ran back and told me this and I just yeah Email straight away. I didn't even think about it. And that was it. Then you <laughs> had it, it in your sights. I did. <laughs> well, congratulations on getting it here. So how did this exhibition come about? How did you make your pitch to Yves Saint Laurent? Well, I went over to the Fondation in Paris, which is the second empire building, like, like this building in the Avenue Marceau. Impressive. Impressive, yes. Imposing. Uh, yes, and I go up the stairs and I was shown to their meeting room, which was huge, great long meeting room, with um, the original Andy Warhols, the four portraits of Yves Saint Laurent looking down on me, long table. <laughs> And we sat at no one pressure. end. No pressure. No pressure, and, no. Um, and there were three people opposite. So it was an interview. Um, and then before I started, a Mujik, Yves Saint Laurent's own dog, actually came to sit next to me here. And I was sort of looking down. And I like dogs. And I was about to give him a little fondle. And I thought, what if he snarls at me? Would this be a sign, you know, at the beginning that it's all going to go wrong? Ignore the dog. So, yeah, don't, so don't I decided I'd wait until the end, yeah. But I just took over some pictures, um, you know, just off a photocopy, just printed out the exterior, the galleries, and then I spoke about, you know, the story of Josephine and John and, you know, our French collections and how wonderful it would be. And I think they didn't have the idea that that, you know, it was a problem not being in London, you know. <laughs> so it was, it, you know, that was on our side, I suppose. But I just enthused and, and just went for it, yeah. And then came out afterwards shaking. You know, I wasn't shaking when I went in, when I came out. <laughs> but yeah, so it went, it went very well. Well, they obviously had the vision, which probably shouldn't come as a surprise. They, you know, they, they, yes. they understood they why it was going to work. I think they did. I think Pierre Berger really did understand. And he, he was delighted with the exhibition. He came and opened it for us. Um, and that was really lovely. And he was absolutely... Absolutely delighted. So tell me a little bit more about Josephine Bowes because obviously the museum is in her her former home, which is no, it's not a home. She actually built it as a museum. Did she build it as yes, the museum? Yes, and she she, she her husband John Bowes was very rich. Um, industrialist in the 19th century, but was a Francophile. And um, he went to Paris and actually she was on, a, on, on the theatre, on the stage at the Theatre de Varete. And he bought the theatre and she became his mistress. So one way to do it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's an incredible story. That should, somebody should make a film of it. It's the brilliant. I mean, he was the illegitimate son of the 10th Earl of Strathmore. I mean, and he said so he was sort of a, an English Lord and she got this man um, who had lots of money and um, and she, she spent it. She went wow. to Worth. She went to the father of haute couture in Paris. Worth um, was um, the, the, the dress designer for the Empress Eugenie. So um, Josephine obviously had to go there. And we have all her bills. We know how much she spent on her clothes, which was more than she spent on some of the pieces in the collection. That's incredible. Now, I, so I knew that they built this place together, but I thought it was to live in because it is this spectacular kind of chateau in the middle of the countryside. I didn't realise they built it as a museum. Yes. Yes, I mean, they brought over a French architect, Jules Pellichet. So there's a lovely, we thought when we were building this, we, this was designed by a French design team in Paris. So this is the second time that we've been working with French plans and finding sometimes the measurements weren't quite what we expected. But of course, in the 19th century, it was, you know, the, those plans would have been metric and, you know, we weren't metric then. So they, we reckon this is the first, the first building that was uh, built in, in metric. Yeah. So it's a fascinating story. And, um, you know, 
know, the whole link with Josephine and her, her you know, her, her fashion and her, you know, we know what she wore, we know what she, what she bought. And it just seems a perfect match, doesn't it, to bring Yves Saint Laurent here. He was an art collector with Pierre Berger and John and Josephine just spent 15 years collecting art for this museum. Wow, she would have loved to see this here then. I she think. would, yeah. yes. Yeah. So tell me about the collection. This is, this is um, the kind of full spectrum, really, of, of Yves Saint Laurent's work from, mm -hmm. how far back does it go to, right up yeah. until the end of his... his yes, it's, it's his whole, over 40 years, mm -hmm. it, it spans his career, and we actually start, and I'm so excited that we've actually got pieces from Dior, because he became head of Dior at age 21. I mean, incredible. And I mean, sadly, Christine Dior died in 1957, and, and you know, he already had um, Saint Laurent working for him, and he taught him, you know, the real, real haute couture methods, which never Never left Yves Saint Laurent. He's probably the last of the great couturiers, actually, after Chanel and, and Dior. Um, so he then, yeah, it's just it's just really good to have those early pieces. Um, and then we discovered one that we didn't know about, um, which, which is, is another that? huge story, which I could carry on and tell you about, um, because when we when we were looking at the, the Dior link, I remembered um, that, he, that Dior used to show to Princess Margaret in the 1950s, because she was a great fan of Dior. Wasn't supposed to be, because he wasn't really, but anyway. Um, so was she supposed to wear English she was supposed to be, Yes, exactly, right. not, not French. But, but Dior had come over um, and shown her the collection in previous years. But of course, once he died, Yves Saint Laurent's collection in 1958 um, came over to be shown at Blenheim Palace um, in aid of the Red Cross Society for Princess Margaret and assembled guests and uh, we found the programme through the Dior archives and tried to find the dress, any dress that was in that show because we thought it would be a really nice link, this is a piece that was shown in Britain um, and we had great difficulty and we found one um, in the Palais Galliere in Paris which was a blue velvet and I went through all the loan process, official forms, got it agreed and when they were going to the stores to get this out to check it for conservation they found another dress and they weren't quite sure what it was or where it belonged or whether they'd lost the provenance, I don't know. But anyway, it turned out it was this most fabulous bright pink dress called Zephyrine. And it was worn by Yves Saint Laurent's favourite model, Victoire. And we found Pathé coverage of that, that catwalk piece. Um, so it's just, it was just wonderful. And Dior helped us conserve the dress. They, they, and they lent us a, a lot of the uh, documents. So it's never been seen before. And we'd, we worked out that it was the exact exact dress that the model had worn that day in, in, in Blenheim. It's the same dress. How amazing. <laughs> you have this very interesting mix, obviously, when you're, you're dealing with a subject like um, Yves Saint Laurent of kind of history and art and also mm -hmm. obviously contemporary fashion and commerce. I mean, how, how easy is it to balance all of those things in an exhibition and to kind of you know, show them all at work because mm -hmm. they're all part of. Well, that they are. Process. Well, they're not. It wasn't really a problem because the Fondation Pierre Berger Yves Saint Laurent was, was is a very separate. It's an archive that they set up and planned. Um, so it's very separate from the commercial side of Saint Laurent as we know today and Hedy Slimane and all that side of it. It is very separate. So it wasn't really there wasn't really a, 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 a conflict at all. Um, but it was good, uh, you know, that we've got the collections going right up into you know 2002 to you know which. Which is, you know, when he, you know, when he retired. So we are showing the whole 40 years. So it is the first retrospective. But what's special about it is that it's actually been um, made to fit with our collections. So it's actually unique, and they've never done this before. I mean, they, there are Yves Saint Laurent exhibitions around the world. They, the Fondation do do that. They're mm -hmm. promoting his his legacy. Um, but this one, they Pierre Berger himself said, I want some connection with this wonderful French chateau art collection and so um, that was what was really exciting working out how we could do that and the themes that it created and those themes then became the themes for the rest of the exhibition so what are they can you can you run through them I can indeed well we the first one is we called haute couture and that was linking with the, the work that he he was a great admirer of Scaparelli and of surrealism and actually we have a Scaparelli that's on show in our fashion gallery um, and it's slightly surrealist 
interest in its, in its design. So that was an easy one. I mean, they all just came, you know, I worked with the head of collections there, Sandrine, um, and we got on really well. And it was just a really nice, so she came over for a couple of days here. And, uh, and, then, we, and then we did one called Masculine Feminine. We've kept the French words because, you know, it seemed right. Um, and that's, li that's looking at his 1960s um, collection, you know, the first trouser suit on the catwalk, the first jumpsuit, the, you know, the first tuxedo. So, I mean, so important, those, those iconic 60s pieces. So we've got a, a, a more masculine man's um, uh, pinstripe suit, but in the case with our historic collection, which is um, First World War, the more tailored styles women were starting to wear, but there were skirt suits, they weren't trouser suits. And so we've made that link. And then we go on to transparence, which is to do with lace. And this is, the, the I don't know if you've seen, the, the ultimate little black dress, I reckon. Really sexy back with this lace going quite low um, at the back. And, um, and that links with our very, very important collections of, um, of lace, and particularly black chantier French lace. So we've actually showing it next to Empress Eugenie's own bodice, which is trimmed with chantier lace, which we have in our collection. Wow. So, I mean, it was just easy, really, in a way. Made for each other. But they were, them, absolutely. Yeah. It, just, it just worked beautifully. And then art, which we're now here um, in, this, in this group of art. But actually, we introduce it in the fashion gallery with, with the homage to Picasso um, and Harlequin. And that's a patchwork skirt linked with our 19th century Weirdale quilt. Okay. I mean, what a, you know, what a strange mixture. But it works. It and what, works. What have you learned about, about the man putting this collection together? Because as you say, you know, his inspirations were many and varied. You know, we've got the, the Mondrian dress behind us, as you yes. say. Yeah. Art and culture was, uh, uh, and craftsmanship was all part of, of what he so. did. I mean, yeah. how is it to actually get to ha handle those fabrics and look at the pieces that Amazing. he created? Amazing, it is, yeah. I mean, the quality is so, so immense. I mean, his legacy, what really hit me, I think, is that, you know, today we're all affected by Yves Saint Laurent. Everybody has been, all the designers, um, and it's it's in the high street. You know, the things like the tuxedo, the smoking, you know, it's just gone on and on. I mean, he was, he was first with so many, so many things, but really, really, really a craftsman, as you say, um, you know, and, and We've tried to. We've got another theme which is called Alchemy of Style, which is to do with his creative process and his twirls, which you'll see are just. You could wear them. I mean, you know, and they're just they're just the things to you know the three dimensional form of his sketches. And we've got his original sketches, which for the first time these these are being shown. I mean, there was the foundation really believed in the UK should have the best show with all the most iconic pieces to really show um, what what a, a creative genius he was. You know, just precocious talent really. I know, starting at twenty one as well. It's quite amazing. I know. Well, he started before that. In fact, he started, and we've all also got. As an adolescent, he was he was he was designing pa for paper dolls. He was designing whole wardrobes in paper, and he cut out the models from his mother's Vogue fashion magazines, um, and stuck them on cardboard, and then made the outfits, and then would give his mother's friends fashion shows and do the programs. And we've got them; they kept them, and we've got some of them in this exhibition. Oh, so point. you see where he started. And we can also see, I mean, it's interesting seeing the pieces from across the years so close together. This kind of riot of colour, particularly mm -hmm. in this room that we're in now. His use of colour, was that unusual at the time? Was that groundbreaking? I think it was, and I think he, they, you know, it's always said that Yves Saint Laurent loved black um, most, and of course the 60s thing and the more masculine styles, I mean, he used black and in transparence. But actually, his love of colour, he says, stemmed from Marrakesh, um, of course, because he had a house there and there's still the, the Jardin Majorelle, um, and it's that, you know, and that really introduced him to really, really exotic colours, blues and pinks later on. And what about women on the high street now? When, when we, we go out shopping or we you know, pick up a fashion magazine or look at a fashion mm -hmm. website, what aspect of his legacy are, are we oh, seeing so there? I think there's so many. I mean, trousers for a start. I mean, you know, I mean, yes. Trousers for evening. He, he was really the first to put women into trouser suits for the evening. And of course, at the time, I mean, you know, people were being turned away from Ascot and from clubs because, you know, women weren't allowed to wear trousers, you know, and so they'd just take them off and wear the mini dress and got away with it, <laughs> which is ridiculous, really. But yes, there's, it, I mean, so the wearing of trousers is certainly, I think, um, and also, I mean, the use of transparent materials, which, I mean, is, and lace, you know, which is still on the high street today. I mean, there's all, I think I think he filters down in so many ways. He had quite a kind of uh, 
he seemed to have a bit of a grasp about about what was real as well. For someone who kind of worked in such a rarefied world and was, you know, such a, a kind of linchpin of French fashion, he did introduce the first diffusion line, didn't he, with Reeve Gauche? He, he, he did, with Reeve Gauche, yes. I mean, there was Petit Porter already in France beginning in the 50s, but he was the one, I think, that really sort of created this boutique sort of atmosphere. And of course, the first one was in 1966 um, at Reeve Gauche on the left bank. And then in 1969, he opened in Bond Street. And it was, uh, yeah, it was really, I think, a very good moment there's that famous photograph of him with his muses because I mean he loved women and so his muses were very important to him Lulu de Falaise and Betty Cratru on either either arm and she's you know wearing the, the safari suit as he is you know um, that's a really iconic picture did he believe that women should have certain key pieces in their wardrobe I know that the safari suit was was one of them one of the, these kind of a t- Fashion yeah. fades, style is yeah. eternal type things that you mm-hmm. needed. What were the others? Mm-hmm. Well, he said he always wanted to create a working wardrobe for women. I mean, in the 60s, that's what he's saying. And he was in his 20s. He was, he was, he was you know, in tune with, with the youth. And although he was probably, aware, he was probably designing for, for their mothers in, at Dior, but as soon as he had his own label, he was designing for the daughters. He was designing for women. He wanted it to be affordable. So, I mean, it was, it was in all sorts of ways. But he said he wanted a work, work wardrobe which I mean mainly was trouser suits really um, and smart skirts it's in the pea jacket that reefer jacket Love which that. I mean is wonderful yeah but we you know we're all affected by those designs I mean so Joanna you've been working on this exhibition for two years now do you have a favorite piece oh it's so difficult it's so difficult it changes I mean yeah I love them all I mean the Mondrian I have to say when we lifted the lid of the box and it was there two-dimensionally and then to actually put it on the mannequin and see how it worked you know three-dimensionally was was quite a moment but I mean I just love I think probably you know the trouser suits because I was a tomboy so I just I just really yeah thank him for giving us you know so many good good trousers to, to, to play with, to play with. Yes. love a, love a good trouser <laughs> and you know what about this this exhibition as a coup for the museum because it is absolutely fantastic to have it here I guess you must mm-hmm. feel a bit like the sky's the limit now for, for what you could do next well I don't know yeah how can we <laughs> how can we top this is what I'm worried about at the moment but no it's fantastic for the bows yeah and we've been you know we've been wanting to to do something really big and I've sat in my office thinking, if only wouldn't it be wonderful wouldn't it be wonderful if we did an exhibition and got five star reviews in the newspaper which we're getting you know I mean so yeah it's just like a bit of a dream now and I'm starting to you know <laughs> just sort of relax and uh, just yeah, enjoy it hopefully. enjoy it yeah and, I, and it's so lovely to see visitors enjoying it and yeah yeah and people are coming up from London for the day well, yeah, you can do it because it's quite it's early in the morning really and, <laughs> yeah. and it's packed already yeah, yeah, how, how yeah, long is the yeah, exhibition yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. here until October the 25th so there's plenty of time mm-hmm.